Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Dunn is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Two Guys in a Bible right here on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. I am William Bell and am delighted to be with you today. But along with me is our illustrious and erudite co-host, Dr. Don Preston. And... Uh, we have a great uh, study lined up for you tonight. I'm sure uh, he always does. And so we're looking forward to getting into that uh, just shortly. But before we do, I'm going to um, see what's going on in his world and let him lead off tonight and uh, telling us what's happening. Well, a whole lot of the same, William. Uh, William, it's been a really good week with correspondence from any number of different places. Uh, spent some time uh, on the phone this this morning with a gentleman from South Africa. Uh, he's had some encounters with some of the folks on Facebook uh, that have been less than pleasant, and he he's really quite astounded, to be honest, at, at the negativity and the unchristian behavior of so many people that he has encountered. Uh, pardon me, on Facebook. And, of course, you and I are very, very familiar with that. Uh, and it's really a sad testimony, but nonetheless, uh, he was just literally shocked at, at the unchristian behavior uh, of some of the folks who called themselves Christians and who who think, for all practical purposes, say they believe that they that they're God's gift to the world of theology. When in fact, they are so immature uh, in their biblical knowledge and, and so lacking in their biblical knowledge that it's it's really stunningly bad. But all, all of that aside, had a good conversation with him, uh, had some uh, really excellent emails with different people from different places uh, this week. It was uh, one, one correspondence was really kind of interesting. I got this uh, somewhat, uh, I, I don't know if you would call it cryptic. I don't know if you would call it curt. Uh, it wasn't an overtly friendly email. But it said, I'm just curious. I want to know why you continue to publish the book by Sam Frost, Essays on the Resurrection, since he has abandoned the preterist view. So I was just wondering why you continue to publish his book when he no longer believes that. So I responded, and I pointed out, number one, I continue to publish it because The book itself teaches the truth. And number two, Sam Frost gave the book to me and told me that I was free to do with it, quote, whatever I wish to do, unquote. And then, interestingly enough, he responded to me in a rather lengthy email, thanking me for my ministry and saying that it was literally beyond his ability to comprehend now, anyone once adopted covenant eschatology would then turn away from it because uh, the evidence is just too overwhelming. The logic is there. Uh, the, the, the testimony of the scripture is just too plain. And anyway, he went on to express appreciation for your ministry and mine and, and to simply say that It has been a complete paradigm shift for him, but he just feels that for one of the very first times in his life that he genuinely has the concrete answers to so many questions uh, that he has had throughout his life. 
So it was a very, very interesting, you know, the very first email kind of put me on a little bit of a defensive thinking, oh, boy, here we go. Uh, I'm going to be attacked from, you know, uh, upside down and what have you. And then it turned out to be, well, great. That's a great answer. I appreciate that. And, boy, you and William are both doing such a great job. So uh, it was an interesting phone call. Had some other uh, messages uh, similar to that in vain, uh, just expressing their appreciation for our ministries, our our joint work together, uh, and and how we are together able to communicate so well uh, and, and to exercise proper hermeneutics. So it, it's just been one of those weeks where uh, continuing correspondence with people from a little bit of everywhere, uh, it continues to grow. It continues to be so expressive of of thanksgiving for the message of fulfillment. Now, William, I think we need to get, I think we need to get your impression, William, of how you think the domestic would have been, uh, you know, just the other night. Because uh, I've certainly got my own impressions of that. I'll be more than happy uh, to, to share those. But I'd like to, uh, like for you to tell us what you thought of your debate with William Benson. Okay. Well, um, first of all, uh, it was interesting. Uh, it was short. <laughs> That's the first impression <laughs> I got. <of. laughs> and and I have to uh, I have to acknowledge. Don said that's not going to be enough time. And I knew that it wasn't going to be uh, quite enough time. But I thought I could get something done within that period of time. I didn't think it was going to take all that much to dispel his arguments, but, um, man, I did feel the crunch, but what was really, uh, and let me just say this, and I'm not making any excuses. I'm not trying to take back anything in terms of my performance in the debate, but there was a condition that was created in that, uh, discussion that I had to labor with at the very end of it. And that, um, uh, and that was, um, we were to exchange questions in the debate. And I submitted my questions to, um, well, w- William Vincent gave me his questions first. I took two days and I responded to them. And that was only because I was busy and had other things that I had to do. And I, you know, but I did get them back to him within two days uh, so that he could have them to go over them. And you, you know that because you know that I questioned you about, you know, how quickly uh, we should exchange the questions you said right away. And I said, okay, well, I'll get right on it. And, um, and so when I sent him my questions uh, somewhere around Sunday, I think, or Saturday, Saturday or Sunday, uh, he said he would get them to me. I think that evening or whatever. Well, that evening turned out to be 9:46 PM Saturday night, almost a week later, which was uh, and, and, and by the time I got them, you know, I had been working a, a little bit on the debate, you know, and, and uh, other things. And so I was tired and my intentions were to go to bed that night early so that I would be refreshed, you know, mentally and physically the next morning. Well, uh, getting his questions at that point in time, I had to go through them to find out what he said, because I had intended to use some of the um, responses he had to the questions in the discussion. However, you know, and I, and I was about one o'clock that morning finishing up responses to the questions because I also wanted to send them to you just to have you double check them, look them over, see if you saw anything, you know, as we usually do when we, when you're preparing for a debate, we always exchange, you know, uh, and, and ask each other, you know, what do you think about this, et cetera. So Correct. Um, immediately after I finished, I sent them to you. But by that time I was exhausted and uh, cause I had labored hard that day and um, I was really exhausted and I had intended to get to bed early um, and I couldn't because of that. But I didn't want to go into the discussion, not at least looking at what his responses were and, uh, and res- responding to them. And I tell you, there were some doozies on that list, as you know, hey, but I didn't get a chance to, to use any of them because I was so weary um, you know, in terms of, of just mentally exhausted from, from the labor that day that I um, 
it just wouldn't stick in my mind in terms of, you know, the things that were on those questions. And so I let that go. And so by the time we got to the discussion, I mean, I was fine, but at the very end, and I'm sure if you listened at the very end, I mean, my mind was just going out of it. It was just, just kind of burnt to the crisp as far as that. And I know that was because I was up late that night, you know, dealing with that, but that's not an excuse for my performance in the debate at all. Um, I, uh, it was just a condition that happened. Uh, William Vincent apologized for taking so late to get him to me, but I just thought that that, you know, um, and I had to remind him at least once or twice to send me those questions. And, um, and, and I didn't get them until almost 10 PM that night. So anyway, that part well, aside, let, let, let me uh, interject here for everyone's, uh, everyone's consideration. I told William Bell uh, that given the short time frame, that I would not be surprised whatsoever that William Vincent either would not get his answers to William's questions to him at all, but then on air would express pro- a profound apology uh, for not doing so. Uh, or that he would get to his answers to William so late that it would be almost, almost uh, too late for you to go over them and to consider them. And William asked me, so do you really think that he would do that? I said, well, unfortunately, I've been in this debate game an awful long time. I have seen about every trick that you can imagine. I hate to ascribe debate trickery to William Vincent. You would certainly hope that he would not do such a thing. And yet my prediction that he would wait until the very last moment before sending William his answers. And remember, William contacted him twice. I have the emails. William contacted him twice, reminding him that he was waiting on the answers. And William would write back and say, oh, I'm awfully sorry. I just slipped my mind. I've been preoccupied, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? Common courtesy says that you ought to fulfill your obligation. And so exactly like Don Preston said, William Vincent doesn't submit his answers to the questions until almost 11 o'clock the night before the debate. That is just simply not fair. It's not acceptable. Press his apology to William, exactly like I said he would do. And so it's deeply, deeply troubling to me. You would hope and you would pray that William Vincent would not do such things. And yet the scenario that I suggested would happen is precisely what happened. Now, is it possible that everything was perfectly legitimate? Well, anything's possible in this world, it seems. And yet one has to wonder why that scenario played out precisely as Don Preston said it was going to. And so I I think the listener needs to be aware of this and and consider that. Why is it that a man would wait until the 11th hour, as it were, after being requested twice and after apologizing twice for not getting them submitted expeditiously and then finally just delay until the 11th hour. Why would a man do that? I mean, it, if you realize the very first time that you had not kept your word and you say, I'm so very sorry, I'll get on this, and then you don't get on it. You don't get on it. You don't get on it. And so that second request comes, and you just simply reiterate your apology. Oh, my goodness, I, it just slipped my mind. I'm so terribly sorry. I'll get right on it, but you don't get right on it again until the very last moment. And, you know, I, I hate to be so suspicious, but as I said, 
Uh, I have been on the, in this debate game for an awful long time. I've seen an awful lot of tricks. And this is one of the most common tricks. When a person knows that he dare not give you the opportunity to have sufficient time to go over your answers as needed. Instead, you submit them the very last moment when there's precious, precious little time to review them and insufficient time for William Bell to draft his proper responses. So that's all I'll say on that. Well, that's that pretty much summarizes, you know, what the situation was. And, um, and you know, I had to get up early so I could, you know, be at the station and everything and be prepared and all. But um, uh, beside that, you know, I, I was I felt very good about the discussion and I didn't get a chance to even listen or, or read the comments that were on the page until afterwards. And um, it's really um, interesting comments. As a matter of fact, I think it, I only saw maybe one, possibly two people who um, – uh, were in Vincent's camp, and one of them, <laughs> I don't even know whether we can count because, you know, it doesn't matter what we say, he's going to reject it. You know, we could say uh, Jesus was the Son of God, and he'd probably reject it just because we're president. <laughs> we're president. That's exactly right. <laughs> I know exactly who you're talking about. <laughs> but um, there was one uh, technical issue, and uh, that was uh, the low volume from the call-ins and um, I heard it, but I couldn't tell whether that was just a studio thing at first uh, that I could barely hear. Uh, And then once someone brought it to the attention, uh, you know, the um, uh, production manager, you know, got the, uh, the producer got the um, volume up where people could hear. So I apologize to the audience for that. That was totally beyond my um, control. And, um, and because I was trying to focus on what was being said, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to that. I want to thank Don for doing an excellent job, an outstanding job of, you know, really holding us, you know, to the uh, guidelines and, and keeping us in the short time frame because we did not have a large window of time to work <laughs> that. And so, <laughs> I mean, I was so very conscious of it that, um, you know, I, I just – went right in. And of course, Vincent, uh, William Vincent went right in as well. And we had, I think, uh, 50 minutes, 50 actual minutes to work with for the debate. And that's aside from the introductions, which we kept to a minimum uh, of at least about 30 seconds, I think. And, um, and so the speeches of 10 minutes each, um, you know, for each of us to get into in a, an affirmative and a negative, and then it was supposed to be five minutes closed. Um, I think uh, there was a little bit of confusion at the end with those last two minutes because they weren't really supposed to be there. And, uh, but that's okay. You know, things like that happen and we just, we just let it happen. And, and I know the time was running out and I was trying to watch the producer because, you know, she usually counts me down at the end, uh, giving me the amount of seconds because, you know, they run on the clock and that's money. So she couldn't run over and I, I couldn't understand whether she was telling me, you know, I'm trying to listen to Dunn, to, you know, in his 30 second cues or whatever. And I'm looking at her trying to catch her cues. <laughs> and so that got a little confusing at the end. And all the while I'm trying to think at the same time. So that got a little bit confusing. And I was thinking she said I had, you know, maybe uh, a minute left or 50 seconds. She said, no, five seconds. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just cut it off real quick and, and, you know, and got out of there because, you know, I know they're held responsible for that time and they really have to stay on time. But um, right. beyond that, you know, beyond those little technical snafus, um, I think everything else was fine. Um, I, as far as the, uh, the presentation, I think the, the arguments on um, the image of God in terms of, you know, one, Romans eight twenty nine and 30, being conformed to his son, and that has to take place through conversion. Uh, the fact that Adam lost the image of God uh, once he sinned, that he was that the image of God has to do with, you know, his character, his holiness, uh, righteousness and uh, and being renewed in the knowledge of him from uh, Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 and Colossians 3 uh, and verse. Uh, I think also the um, and then putting on the new man, et cetera. You know, that that raises a lot of in- interesting questions. You know, you wonder almost how many men. Uh, done do we have to put on in order to be conformed (laughs) to (laughs) the image of christ because these 
you know, it's so funny. These guys, they come up with more men, more bodies, more deaths, more everything. I was listening to a conversation, uh, you know, we got into it, you know, how these guys, you know, they're going to attack us no matter what. And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, and they're coming up. I think Ed Stevens, for example, has about three deaths. I know he has, at, you know, a couple of, but and now we got two kinds of flesh and blood. I just realized uh, that we got two kinds of flesh and blood, you know, one that's mortal and yep. one that's not mortal, and et cetera. And this stuff is just getting crazy how they keep, multiplying things to fit these paradigm, you know, to fit their uh, future paradigm and trying to refute us. And, and so they come up with all these new men and therefore all these new images of God, because, you know, they have to be, but um, that, you know, was one of them that I think was a very solid point, very uh, profound. And he yeah, really me, didn't uh, touch it. Yeah. Let me comment on that. I, uh, when you made the point, of course, you and I had talked about that point before, the debate ever took place. But that point there on Romans eight twenty nine, 29, uh, whom he foreknew, he predestinated to be conformed to the image uh, of God's son. Uh, to me, that is just one of those, uh, well, to use the terminology, that's one of those in your face, you can't deal with this kind of argument. Because uh, if, if a person's physical form is the form of God, if it's the image of God, then nothing that we do in this world makes us any more conformed to that image. His image is our image. Our image is his image. And therefore, to suggest that through conversion, through faith, being transformed in our minds, to use the terminology of Romans 12 too, to suggest that anything that we could do would transform us into the image of God is really just a moot point. And, and I'll be really honest with it, with you. I don't think William Benson, I, I'm not sure he fully understood the argument. He certainly did not deal with the argument in any way, substantively whatsoever. He talked about it, but he did not deal with it. I thought, I thought his answer was a whole lot of a, you know, Dance around the mountain. I'm going to say lots of words, but I'm not going to say anything type of response. But I, I really thought that was a fantastic point. Like I said, uh, you and I had talked about it before the debate ever took place. And I, just, I told you then that I thought it was an incredible point, and I still do. Yeah, well, you know, I think the, the contrasting point of that, which was the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, nine through 11 that pointed out those who had those opposite characteristics would not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet at the same time saying that they had been sanctified, they'd been washed, sanctified and justified uh, in, in the name of the Lord and, and of our God. And so uh, that um, really strengthened, I think the point in terms of the image of God uh, being reflective of his character that's revealed in the new Testament through the message of Christ, which is what, uh, Paul says, uh, again, in Ephesians 4. Uh, another point that I thought was uh, very uh, telling was when he tried what appeared to make <laughs> to be to make the form of God and the form of man uh, it's almost identical, you know, the same. It was like, you know, okay, if, if you're in the form of God, um, then and the form of man is God, then which one of them is the form of man? So uh, that was a, uh, a point from Philippians chapter 2 as well that um, I thought was um, uh, very, very interesting in the way that he tried to respond to it. Uh, but that text is very clear that Christ was in the form of God and was made in the likeness of men, took upon him the form of a servant and uh, – was made in the likeness of men and then found in appearance as a man. And so, um, again, that, that distinction between, uh, between that point, I, I think a point that probably really got him, um, uh, at least in terms of, uh, all that they had been saying about it, because I think they had banked a lot and, and, and he had banked a lot on Colossians one in verse 15. And that is a very, very interesting text. Uh, as well, yes. um, 
because, you know, as you and I discussed it a little bit before, uh, you know, before the, the debate, um, and I did some research on it and, and looked it up. And, you know, the first thing that stuck out with me when I looked at the passage was, you know, it used the word uh, prototikos um, twice in that text, verse uh, 15, and also in verse 18. And, of course, I was totally familiar with verse 18, where it talks about Christ being the firstborn from the dead. And that, that is the text and the quote from Psalm 2-7 uh, and Acts 13 and verse 33 that says, uh, today, uh, for you are my son, today I have begotten you. Um, this day I have begotten you. And so that is clear uh, in terms of the fulfillment of the promise to raise Jesus from the dead. And that is the beginning of the, uh, the first fruits. That's the beginning of the uh, new creation. Etc. So we're dealing with the new creation, but Colossians 1.15 spoke of him as the beginning and a re- referring to the creation. So we're not talking about the same uh, in both of those verses. They're not dealing with the same subject. One is talking about Christ in his incarnation. Now, you have Vincent using that text in order to demonstrate that Christ had a physical body because he's the image of God. That was his whole point. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, he, he's using Colossians 1.15 to say that Christ had a physical body. And that is a text that said he did all of these things before anything was created. All right. So that's the Christ that was before creation, before anything visible or invisible was created. And thus Christ having the image of God being uh, this physical body that he's talking about. Now, he, he's trying to deny that he uh, didn't believe that Christ had a physical body before his incarnation. Uh, he's been trying to push that, but that's not what he argued, and that's not what he stood for, and what he happily signed his name, so to speak, to and, and agreed to as far as the discussion was concerned. But, you know, once I showed that that referred to Christ as the wisdom of God, uh, which was also backed by the text in Proverbs 8 because, you know, wisdom was there from the beginning and you got text in Job, which I didn't necessarily bring out at the time due to the time, but Job 33 and I think uh, verse 4, or verse 8 or somewhere in there, uh, you've got those passages where uh, God is questioning Job about what, what he knew about the creation, et cetera, and demonstrating uh, wisdom from that point of view. And then you have the text very clearly in Colossians chapter 1, And verse 30, that says that Christ has been made to us wisdom, righteousness, uh, sanctification, and redemption. So the harmony of the text is very, very clear. If Christ is the wisdom of God, and as I pointed out, wisdom is one of the key words. You know, as you study uh, the books of the uh, New Testament or any books of the Bible, sometimes the key words in those books will kind of stand out because they are repeated several times within the book, and there's, a, there's an emphasis on them. Well, wisdom is one of the key terms in Colossians. And so to establish, especially in the background and context of, of the Greeks who sought after wisdom, as you see in, Col- in 1 Corinthians, uh, the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. And so what was God's answer to the Greeks seeking wisdom? Uh, to the Jews, it was Christ crucified, just as Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 12. But to the Greeks, it was Christ, the wisdom of God. And so you had that same idea. And of course, you had the, the um, false wisdom of the Jews as well. But the point was, he's presenting Christ as the wisdom of God. And for the Jew, any Jew would have known the, the, uh, the concept of wisdom before creation from passages like Proverbs, etc. And even in the apocryphal writings from Sirach and uh, Baruch, I guess, uh, each of those have references to it. I didn't get a chance to bring those out either, but they have, and, and you can read them and see very clearly that that is the emphasis that they're making on uh, the text and the language there. And so when you look at the scholars, they're, they're saying this is that hymn from Proverbs chapter eight, and Christ is being put in that position. And so that's what, uh, what the text was referring to. Um, and showing that Christ, as God's wisdom, 
uh, was the one before whom all things were created. So I think it's a powerful, powerful text from that perspective uh, in um, uh, harmonizing the two firstborn uh, ideas that are found in Colossians 1.15 and Colossians 1 and verse 18. And I don't think, uh, as I said, you know, that um, I don't think he had any clue on what to do with that as far as an argument was concerned. Did you want to say anything here at this point? Well, no, I think you're exactly right, because he did not give any kind of a substantive. He really didn't give an answer at all uh, to your development of Proverbs chapter 8. He did not give any answer at all to your comments on Proverbs, excuse me, Colossians 1, 15 to 18, uh, and that this is discussing Christ's creative work before his incarnation. And, and for him to argue that Colossians 1 is dealing with Christ in a physical body, and yet it's Christ being the creator of all things, both visible and invisible, that takes us back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. Was, the Word was with God. The Word was God. By him all things were created, and without him nothing that was created was made. Well, again, that's the pre-incarnate Christ. It's not Christ incarnated when he took on him the form of man and dwelling among men in the body of flesh. And so Vincent's argument was completely anachronistic. And pardon me, pardon me, it not only ignores the framework and the context and the temporal, to use the word temporal here, the temporal setting for Colossians 1, 15 to 18, and that is, prior to the creation, verse 15 and 16 particularly. But, I, I mean, it completely ignores that whole body uh, of scriptural evidence that ties in what Paul is talking about in wisdom, going back to Proverbs chapter 8. I'm not sure, and, you know, William Vincent is a pretty well-read guy, but I would say, I would venture to say, I could certainly be wrong, but I would venture to say that based upon his response or lack thereof, he had never heard that those concepts certainly not developed in any substantive way. Uh, I think he was at a total loss how to answer the tie-in between Proverbs 8, Wisdom, and Colossians chapter 1. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that because I, I didn't hear any um, any res response. Now, uh, another uh, argument that was made was um, the idea that they've pushed several times, and that is you cannot have an invisible image of an invisible God, so to speak. In other words, you if, if it's form. the – yeah, their argument was you cannot have a form of that which is invisible. Yes, yes, and um, and and I took. <laughs> now it was at at the very end that you know that concept blew me away in terms of what he said about it, because he said if that was the case, you're talking about something that doesn't exist if is invisible. In other words, if God's form is invisible, then the image cannot be invisible. It has to be visible. He said, because that which is invisible does not exist. And I responded, I said, well, if that's the case, then God does not exist because God is invisible. So he had just, you know, uh, destroyed God with he, that particular he, argument. He had given the form, given, he had given the farm away at that point. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that was just a total, uh, uh, abdication of the entire discussion and um it, you know it, it came right at the end but man was it a gym <laughs> as, as, as debating goes uh, that was a gym and i i hope he really understands the the logic that he tried to argue in that point um another uh, one of the things that i mind william and that is let's let's face it this clearly is a mystery to to us since since we are such finite beings but it is difficult for us since we we do not think in such in, incredibly metaphysical, spiritual, uh, you know, abstract, ethereal, whatever word you'd like to use, 
it is difficult to wrap our minds around the fact that the scripture says that Christ was in the form of God, Greek word morphe. Well, morphe generally refers to external form, okay? But then 1 Timothy chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 6 speaks of God being invisible and unseeable. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I didn't bring that one out. I, I, didn't, I didn't bring that one out because I didn't have enough time to do it. I was saving that one. <laughs> I was saving yeah. that one. <laughs> Um, but what I wanted, I mean, if you want to talk about it, if you want to go ahead and put it out there, go ahead, you know. No, I'm simply um, saying that as human beings, it is difficult for us, <clears throat> pardon me, to wrap our head around those two concepts that seem on the surface to be contradictory to one another. That which is invisible, how does that which is invisible have a form? That was William's entire point in trying to make the argument. He was trying to argue if it's invisible, it cannot have form. Well, the bottom line is Scripture affirms both realities. It affirms God was in a form, and it affirms that he is invisible. So however much we as human beings may struggle with those incredibly uh, spiritual realities, they are both nonetheless absolutely true. So... And go ahead and develop that as you intended to develop it. Okay. Uh, what I want to do is go back to this form thing, this morphe. Uh, for example, in, uh, let me see, I think that's uh, John 5 and verse 37. Yes. John 5 and 37, he says, as the Father himself who sent me, oh, and the Father himself who sent me, has testified of me, you have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. Now, wait a minute. Yes. We know God is invisible, but he has a form as an invisible, as the invisible God. Invisible is a form. <laughs> That's a form. Um, it's invisible. You know, just like the Bible says, invisible things were created. We could even think about that in the natural realm. I mean, Wind is invisible or air, it's invisible, but it was created. Um, electricity or current, I would say, running through uh, electrical wires is invisible, but it was created. So you can have invisible things uh, even in our world, what we consider our natural world. But God is clearly said to be the invisible God. Now, here's what's interesting about that. He's argued, for example, from Hebrews 1, you know, they want to talk about Christ being the exact image of the Father. Well, wait a minute. If he's going to be the exact image of the Father, that would demand that he has to be invisible, because if he's not, then he's not the exact image. And, and, and the term, uh, go ahead, you're going to say something there. No, 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 that's fine. I was just laughing at the at the power of the point, uh, how simple it is, and yet how devastating it is uh, to William's entire position. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, so that would destroy the concept of um, of claiming that it had to be physical. Here's another one that um, that that got me uh, in terms of what he's trying to argue. Now he created that video, and I alluded to it in the debate, and he did too. Uh, on Hebrews, and he really felt like he had a strong point on that particular argument. And I thought when I read that, I said, oh, wow. I mean, when I listened to it. Um, and that is from Hebrews chapter 10. All right, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1 says, for the law having a shadow of the good things about to come. Uh, could never with uh, those same sacrifices make the, uh, those who approach perfect. Well, one of the things, apparently, I, and I don't know whether he, he grasped this or not, the verse right before that, Don, as you well know, <laughs> is the verse about the return of Christ. You know, unto those who look for him shall he appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Well, what that means, and that whole chapter, Hebrews 9, and actually the whole book for that matter, but particularly chapter 9, which focuses on the work of the high priest, 
uh, going, you know, into the most holy place, you know, the, the second part of the tabernacle, which is the holy of holies, which is the true image. The, it was the true from which all the material and physical realities that, uh, as God told Moses in Exodus 25, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you in the mount. And so when Hebrews 9 speaks about that, in both verse 11 and verse 23 and 24, he says, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, literally that the good things that were about to come or the coming good things, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've said this many, many times, even uh, in writings. The first place that we see the phrase not made with hands is in Daniel chapter 2, in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and in the interpretation of the dream, I think it's around verses 34, 35, and also 44 and 45. And it refers to the kingdom of God, the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. And as Stephen said, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with men's hands. So this is, and, and as the scripture teaches us in Luke 17 and verse 20, these are points I brought out as well. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. And, of course, one of the questions that I ask him, and even some people in the audience, which I didn't read their comments until late that evening or even the next day, uh, they asked, you know, okay, we've got this invisible kingdom and Christ coming in his kingdom. You know, what kind of throne is he sitting on? Et cetera, you know, all of those kinds of questions, um, which people might think are trivial, but I think they're absolutely valid uh, questions to ask regarding that. But the point here is that this is the um, holy places not made with hands. And in verses 23, it says, therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. Now, that means that the, the shadows and types were the copies of the real things. He says, but the heavenly things themselves would better sacrifices than these. And he alludes right back to that house not made with hands. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the truth, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So it's the invisible things that were the true things from which uh, these were the templates, if you please, these spiritual templates from which the physical outward things were made or created. And it's like the text in Hebrews 11 you know, on that point about you can't have uh, a uh, invisible form to reflect an in, uh, invisible form. Well, Hebrews 11.3 says, by faith, we understand that the ages were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made by things which are visible. Now, I'm sure you can go in a couple of directions with that. You can talk about the things that had not yet been realized that were coming into being, which, again, that's focusing on the fulfillment of the types and shadows. And they're still unseen from that perspective. And even in seeing them, as Paul said in Ephesians 1 and verse 18, you would only be seeing them with the eyes of your understanding. So that's mental perception and, and by reason, et cetera, and not by seeing some some physical, uh, some physical uh, image. And... Um, and so from that perspective, uh, those things are the true things, the templates from which the physical things were made. Even when you talk about a person uh, doing a, if you've got a draftsman, okay, who is going to do a blueprint, the ideas that he puts on that page come from his thoughts and his reason and the pictures that he, you know, the images that he holds in his mind that you can't see until he transforms them or transfers them into, you know, what we would call reality. They're real, actually, when they're in his mind, unseen. But he puts them down on paper so that people can see that and, and, and creates this uh, schematic drawing, if you please. And then from that, you know, you'd give it to a contract and he takes the actual materials and puts it into a finished product. So the, uh, the real vision of that was in the invisible realm, <laughs> Uh, within the thoughts of his mind. You know, if you cut his head open, you couldn't find them. 
uh, because <laughs> you, you're not going to find them that way, thinking that that's, that's where they are, because they're, they're in the ideas and the concepts, you know, as people have said, and as I've studied, you know, positive uh, 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 development and stuff, thoughts are things. And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, those, you know, those kind of concepts. And so that's the, uh, that's the idea. But here's the point that he was making. Here's one point that he makes from that. He's using the types and shadows of Hebrews 10 to say that those were the shadows, but the physical body of Christ is the substance. Now, Don, <laughs> how can the physical body of Christ be the substance of the shadows and types when Christ's physical body up to the point of his death was fulfilling the types and shadows. It just doesn't make sense at all. He is so, you know, just backwards on that particular point. And, and I think it destroys him uh, because Christ came to fulfill the law and the prophets to fulfill the types and the shadows. And so from that, uh, from that perspective to say that his body, which, which um, he's still operating in the realm of the flesh. And that's what first Peter chapter three and verse 18. And, and these guys are still uh, struggling with that text. Christ was put Boy, to death. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. He was put to death in the flesh. That's a sphere. That's a realm. Those are locatives in Sarki. That's where the action of his death occurred. He was born of a woman born under the law and within that realm he was put to death and that's what our salvation is all about i mean these discussions that we're having with this peter anderson guy uh he's having issues with it he can't deal with it either because they don't grasp the two eons or ages that christ's death burial and resurrection um are the uh, consummation or, or, and, and uh, the uh, transformation from the one to the other. And so he's put to death in the flesh, but he's made alive in the spirit. Those are two different spheres. And that's what the, uh, and, and in that new sphere is where the image of God is seen. And that is why we have to go back to Romans eight twenty nine and 30 conformed to the image by being what by being called by the gospel by being sanctified through the gospel being justified through the gospel and being glorified which is entering into the kingdom of god so there you have um the idea of the fulfillment of those types and shadows uh, in terms of moving into this, this new realm where they are fulfilled. They're fulfilled in the realm of the spirit. It was, it, Christ could not fulfill the glories of the kingdom of God. He could not fulfill his mission and role as the priest after the order of Melchizedek in the realm of the flesh, in the old covenant tabernacle. That's why the text says in Hebrews 8, that he is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, meaning without hands. That's the idea. That's a, a, a very critical point. And he, he claims he's going to unpack that for us in the next discussion, if there is going to be one. I sent him a message over today, as you know, that if he wants yes. to extend the discussion, uh, hmm. that we can do it via video or we can um, and then uh, upload the audio, strip the audios, up, upload them here to Fulfill Radio. If he wants to just do them on Fulfill Radio, that's fine as well. Um, but uh, that's that's another point. And then um, the 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 other point that I made was from Second um, Corinthians. Chapter three. With the transformation from the ministration of death from the letter, which again is this, uh, it, you know, uh, the concept of the types and shadows. As a matter of fact, any argument that they make concerning the image of God 
and concerning eschatology in general is going to be destroyed by this concept of the types and shadows that reveal uh, the true image and the true copies from which the physical and material things were copied. And so uh, you have Paul talking about the ministration of death. And, and in that, you know, he's, he's saying that they're moving or transitioning out of glory or from glory to glory. Now, the ministration of condemnation, of course, had glory, but he says that the ministration of righteousness so far exceeds it in glory that it makes the other appear that it had no glory. And what was happening was those who were trying to hang on to that old covenant realm, to that, uh, to the law, etc., were as though they were in, in Exodus when Moses came down out of the mount and they didn't want to look steadily at his face. Now, just think about that for a moment, Don, and I know you have. But think about that. Moses has a glory on his face that is too bright because he has been in the presence of God. And ladies and gentlemen, this, <laughs> there is so much to be developed here. God usually travels in a dark cloud. And I suppose that, you know, when you, when you talk about the manifestation of God and you look at it in the Old Testament, it's a dark cloud um, yes. to shield the brightness of his glory when he makes these manifestations before man. But at any rate, Moses was just reflective of that glory. And Israel could not look on the face of Moses, whose glory was already passing away. So it wasn't even the fullness of that reflective glory that was on the face of Moses. It was already passing away. And yet Israel said, Oh, no, don't let us see that, you know, put a veil over your face. And the, the analogy or the illustration that Paul uses of that is as they are still trying to find God and the glory of God in the old covenant, the veil of Moses still lies on their face. Not literally, but uh, in terms of, of Moses having a veil, but in the reading of the Old Testament, in trying to follow the types and shadows, because they're looking, you know, at at the shadows instead of at the, at the tr reality. And, and so from that perspective, he says that veil is there, but then he says, but when they turn to Christ and Christ, <laughs> this is another one that, that gets me. Sometimes they can't hold more than one thought. And I, I'm not trying to belittle, but some of the guys that we know haven't come up, you know, been around long enough to really grasp these things. And they think they're, you know, they just really got it. They, they really do. And they'll come out with some argument that they feel that's just going to destroy preterism. I mean, <laughs> bless their hearts. Um, <laughs> but think about it. Uh, when you look at the text and it mentions Christ, well, Christ is a reference to everything in context. So because one of the uh, rebuttals that they tried to make was that, and I heard this in comments, I, I, you know, Vincent might have made it, but that I have relegated Jesus as a person to a concept. I think Rick Eck, Eckhart was one of the ones who said that, but there may have been others who said it as well. And that was not the issue at all. It's just that they are not able to follow these concepts as they are put together you know, by the Spirit in the Scriptures. So when you look in um, 2 Corinthians 3, where he says, okay, he's made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant and not of the letter. So the contrast there is new covenant versus the law versus the letter. And then we have another contrast that he says, but of the spirit for the letter kills. So now you've got new covenant, you have spirit, then he will call it a ministry of righteousness. And then he will call it the more glory. And then he will call it Christ and liberty. And then by the time you get down to verse 18, he will say, but we all with one, with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed. They were in that present moment already being transformed into the same image. Now, wait a minute. If this glory 
so far exceeded the glory of the old covenant that made it appear that it had no glory. And Moses had reflective glory on his face that was passing. Done. <laughs> Do you see where I'm going with this? Oh, yeah. How could, oh, yeah. How, how could this glory that so far exceeded the glory of the old and the children of Israel couldn't even bear the reflective glory on Moses' face, how could this glory already be in process of being transformed to these new covenant believers and their faces were not, I mean, who knows how many times brighter than the sun? Yeah. If this is a physical image into which That's they the, are being transformed. That's the entire point, obviously. You, can, you yes. cannot back that transforming glory, that greater glory, into anything physical without making that a, an absurdity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and the point being also that it was being done by the Spirit of the Lord, in other words, by that eschatological spirit, that had been poured out in the last days, fulfilling Micah seven fifteen, that according to the days of your coming out of Egypt, I will do uh, marvelous things, and um, meaning that this transformation would be complete by the end of that age, which would be the coming of the Lord, the destruction of the temple, the fulfillment of the types and shadows, and that's why I'm saying all of these things of the types and shadows. So it doesn't matter what argument Vincent makes or any futurist makes. They have to come to grips that we are already now, unless they're going to put themselves back under Torah, put themselves back in the types and shadows, that we're already now in the uh, image of God. And if it's reflective from a physical point of view, that's why I asked him, I said, you know, when he, he was talking about the transfiguration, I've yet to see his face shine like Christ shone. And, um, of course, you know, he's not going to have any answer to that, too. And we can see, you know, he's so proud of his beard that um, <laughs> that um, <laughs> that that's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must have and, that kind of play. Yeah, well, you know, William, and, the, the and look, look, no, I, just, I just have to get yep. this one in. I have to get this one in. That's the second time we've had a guy refer to his beard in the debate. <laughs> Re <laughs> remember, uh, what's his name that you debated? Uh, uh, David. Oh, Joel? Oh, what, no, was no, the name yeah, David? David Hester? <laughs> yes, yeah, yes, yeah, I forgot yeah. that. All right. Uh, we're down to about 90 seconds, so you're about to say something. Go ahead. And I wanted to make an yeah, announcement, well, too, before. All right, but go ahead. Okay. What is so deeply disturbing to me, and, and you and I have discussed this on many occasions, is the fact that all of these futures are so hung up on physicality, on physical bodies, that they refuse to see the spiritual. And the book of John is such a powerful repudiation of that where over and over and over again, the Jews came to Jesus expecting something physical, and Jesus repudiated them and pointed them to the spiritual. You know, uh, the flesh profits nothing. It is the spirit that gives life, John chapter 6. And yet, William Vincent, all of these other guys are looking for that which is flesh and blood. And I'll, you go ahead there and make your announcement. Go ahead and close on out for this evening. All right. Well, I wanted to follow through on this point for just a minute here, right, that we were developing. As Paul said, therefore, since we have this ministry, uh, we, as we have received mercy, do not lose heart. But notice what he says in verse 3. But, it, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Now, if that light is physical, I mean, if that, that needs to be shining on us in some kind of, at least in some physical way, if that's the, the, the manner in which they're going to do it. All right. But anyway, yes. uh, let's um, leave it at that for now. There's much more that we could unpack with that, but I hope we get a chance to do another one because I, you know, there's so much more I want to say about it, but um, 
I wanted to make this announcement, and uh, and I, I hope you don't get discouraged on, uh, but uh, we have been given, that is, Leora and I have been given the opportunity to go back to Africa. Oh, wow. Uh, someone volunteered to send us back, and uh, and I am so eternally grateful. Uh, I had a little bit of unfinished stuff there, and I had talked about, you know, the, the fact that we were already working with some guys. Well, now we got the chance to go back, and we're going to be leaving the end of this month. Um, so we've already, you know, finally got the tickets. Um, you know, we got the tickets scheduled very quickly because, you know, we wanted to do that uh, because I don't want to be, you know, there during the uh, holidays. But we're going to be there at least for a month this time because we've got oh, wow. lots to do. Yeah. And uh, so we're going back to Ghana, and I, I am so grateful for the opportunity. We're looking forward to that. Uh, we've got to make preparations to get, you know, um, videos and recordings made, et cetera. So I want to thank you. Um, I thank the, um, you know, those who, who made that possible. Um, and, um, this, you know, Leora's going with me this time. We're going to stay there for a while, and that girl eats a lot. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm so, you see, I said well, that real low. <laughs> Go ahead. Here, here's my only question. Why would I be discouraged at that? That is no, 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 no. I didn't. I didn't mean it that. Well, you know, I was kidding you when I said that. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was just. I was just kidding you when I when I said that because I know you know we like to travel uh, together and do some of these things together. Um, oh, but yeah. um, that's just the way it turned out, and uh, and I'm I am absolutely thrilled for this. For this privilege and opportunity, I think it's going to be great. We've already got some things happening on the ground, and this trip looks like it's going to be very, very fruitful. Uh, we ask your prayers for it and, um, you know, your support. Uh, if anybody wants to contribute to it, feel free to do so, because I guarantee you we'll make good use of the, uh, of the funds. And, uh, and I was just kidding about my wife eating a lot. She doesn't eat very much, ladies and gentlemen, so, <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't take it that way. But uh, there's a lot. And Don, I have to send you a picture of Apoku. Amazing transformation. Just amazing. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm I'll take a, Yeah, we'll do that. But I know you have to go. It's dinner time. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for hanging in with us tonight and hope you got some um, uh, edica- edification of information from the discussion. Always good to be with you, Don. We appreciate you. And with that, we're going to say good night and God bless. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Dunn Preston and myself, we'd like to say, have a very pleasant day, and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.